part of America's most famous political dynasty, and he's out to disrupt President Biden in the race for the White House. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is testing out the waters of his Democratic presidential bid on a high-profile visit to the Bay Area today. Kennedy is the son of late former Senator Robert F. Kennedy and the nephew of the late former President John F. Kennedy. He's known for his work as an environmental lawyer and for his anti-vaccine views. He's also backed by some big names in tech, including Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey. And while he's considered a long-shot challenger to President Biden, in 2024, a new poll by The Economist and YouGov shows him with a higher favorability rating than both Biden and former President Trump. 49% of voters viewed him favorably compared to 45% for Biden and 43% for Trump. Kelsey Thor had caught up with RFK Jr. as he made several stops here today, and she is live with his message and how he's being received here in the Bay Area. Kelsey? Hey, Liz, as you said, Kennedy spent the entire day here in the Bay Area. He made several stops here in the East Bay before going over the bridge into San Francisco. And his main goal here was to talk about the issue of food insecurity as well as homelessness. And we followed him along as he talked to some local officials all day. 2024 presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s first stop during Thursday's tour of the Bay Area was here at a food bank in San Lorenzo. The presidential hopeful spoke with workers and customers about the rising cost of food and the impact that's having on local families. This food bank, which is Alameda County, has increased over the past three years from, according to the people who work here, from 700 families per month to now 2,700 families per month. Kennedy says food insecurity is one of the top issues his campaign is focused on. He believes the federal government should be spending less money on international military aid and more on helping Americans access food. We have a lot of money for, uh, for foreign wars and for the military industrial complex, we're sending 113 billion to the Ukraine. That money, we wouldn't have to cut any food stamps if we were spending it here at Homs. Kennedy's next stop on the tour was a homeless encampment off 18th Avenue in Oakland. There, he spoke with people living on the street, as well as those who've been helping them out by donating food and other items. Christine Miller has been giving food to the homeless here for years, she didn't realize who Kennedy was at first. She told me she was happy he took the time to come out here and talk with her, but hopes he can actually do something to help. Are they really going to do something to help? That'd be great if they would. It'd be great if they would. Kennedy told me if elected, he would work hard to improve these issues in the Bay Area and across the country. This wonderful energy that San Francisco used to have is, uh, is dwindling at the lightest dimming and it needs to be, it needs to be turned on again. Do you think you can get a lot of support from voters here? Do you think if you were president, you'd be able to turn some of that around? That's what I, that's what I hope to do. Now, a lot of people are looking at Kennedy's campaign as very much a long shot when it comes to uh, the 2024 presidential election. Right now, a lot of people are looking at Governor Gavin Newsom and if and when he's going to enter into the race. I did ask Kennedy what he thought of that. He said that he's all for the governor entering the race. He says it's better for the public to have more choices in a presidential election like this. Well, he's got name recognition, that's for sure. All right, Kelsey, thanks so much. Well, earlier we spoke with Sonoma State political science professor David McEwen. And while he says RFK Jr. isn't a threat to President Biden, he does have a message that resonates with some progressives. He's been the guy that's like your crazy uncle that you invite to, to home uh, for Thanksgiving and says these kind of outrageous things. But it has some pull, especially amongst progressives, who have been increasingly frustrated, not only with the Biden White House, but also with Democrats writ large about war, about corporate America, about where Democrats stand. And this is how uh, RFK Jr. is making some political hay.
Professor McEwen went on to say that RFK Jr. is trying to upset President Biden in the early primary states. The president successfully pushed to change the schedule to have South Carolina's primary first, but New Hampshire and Iowa could move ahead with their contests anyway without Biden on the ballot. So things get very interesting. We're back with you on a Friday for a special rising exclusive interview with 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He joins us now. Welcome to Rising. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we so appreciate it. Uh, so many questions we want to get to. So let's kick it right off uh, with COVID. So friends of our show, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi reported the other day that the earliest COVID patients actually did come from the Wuhan lab. They were scientists there. If this is confirmed, it would all but guarantee the lab leak theory, which I believe you've said in the past, you also think uh, COVID originated from a Chinese lab. If that is the case, I want to know, will you prosecute Fauci and hold others criminally responsible in the U.S. health apparatus who advocated and funded gain-of-function research? Uh, I think I'm going to have to look at that, but I think they should be prosecuted. I think um, it was you know, reckless endangerment. Uh, they knew, you know, these all of these labs, including the Wuhan lab, had a history of leaks. Uh, there were numerous memos from the State Department and others saying that the lab was dangerous. It wasn't even a BSL-4 lab that they were doing these this research in. It was a BSL-2, BSL-3 labs that have, uh, you know, have very, very low thresholds and have, have uh, and this kind of research is malpracticed to do it in the labs that the, the actual scientists who got ill, who they're now saying is patient one, is Ben Hu, who was the underling for the bat lady for Xi Zheng Li, and his funding and her funding came directly from NIH, and NIH taught them the technology for developing, not only for, uh, for making the technology that was used to make these viruses more infectious, uh, more virulent, more deadly, but also the, this technology called the seamless ligation technique, which is just a bioweapons technique for concealing human tampering on engineered viruses. And uh, it was utterly irresponsible to be teaching anybody that they should not have developed that technique in the first place it's the inverse of everything that mm. you would do if you actually were interested in public health mm. it's just um it's bioweapons technology so sticking with COVID, just for one more minute here uh president biden obviously mandated vaccines for millions of workers before the supreme court struck that down president trump presided over operation warp speed uh, to have government funding to get the vaccines off the ground how would your administration have handled vaccines differently in terms of mandates and government funding for them. What did those two individuals do that you would have done differently? They did almost everything wrong. They, you know, first of all, they shouldn't have locked down society. We now know and we knew back then that it would be cataclysmic, that it would cause far more injury and economic costs, long-term economic costs, $16 trillion it's going to cost our country over the long run. It shifted four trillion dollars in wealth from the middle class in our country to this new, you know, uh, uh, oligarchy of billionaires. We created a billionaire day during the pandemic. All of the pandemic response preparedness protocols that have been developed for decades, in fact, almost for a century, all said unanimously, you do not lock down societies, you keep them open. You quarantine the sick, you protect the vulnerable, you keep society open, and then you focus on therapeutic drugs, drugs with proven safety histories. And that's what we should have done. It would have been much more effective to give people even vitamin D and to lock them down and wait for a vaccine that we now know. You know, the Cleveland Clinic study just came out, a new version of the study yesterday that shows that the more vaccines that you got, the more likely you are to get COVID. This is what the science is saying. That's something 56,000 employees of Cleveland Clinic, a, you know, a, a, a major large study is showing the vaccine not only doesn't work, but it works opposite of what we were told that it was going to work. 
we should have focused on the the therapeutic remedies that actually work. It's things like Zithromax, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin. Uh, the countries that use those had much better records. We our protocol gave us the worst body count from COVID on earth. So doing everything that our government told us to do, we racked up 16% of the COVID deaths globally. We only have 4.2% of the population. The countries that used ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, countries like Nigeria didn't even have a pandemic. We were told they were gonna suffer terribly because of their poverty. Instead, they had a death rate one two hundredth of the death rate we had in this country. And you can look across the globe the countries that adopted our protocols did the worst in terms of COVID deaths, COVID mortalities. The countries that did the opposite, that employed ivermectin, employed hydroxychloroquine. Nigeria had a 1.3% vaccination rate, mm. and it had 14 deaths per million population. We had 3,000 deaths per million population. And of course, it was a war on the poor. The poor suffered and shouldered the burden of, of mm. these protocols more than any other parts of our population. Well, to, well, that's a good segue to our next question. Go well, ahead, Brianna. Well, to, to your point, actually, about uh, the aggregation of wealth that happened during the pandemic and how it disproportionately, uh, the, the economic burden was on the poor, and 60 uh, the, the billionaires, millionaires and billionaires' uh, wealth increased by 64 percent in the context of the pandemic. And so I want to put to you, uh, a majority of Americans support a wealth tax for that reasons and others. You've described how much better the economic system was, the cultural, the culture of your youth was in the, the period between the war and the 1980s. Uh, would you support the kind of taxation that also existed back then when there were uh, more taxes levied on the very wealthy? My plan, Brianna, is not to change the overall tax burden. I'll, I will shift the burden around. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that. Uh, I know that I will restore the uh, the child tax credits, and uh, and so the burden will shift. But I'm not going to raise the overall burden on taxes for Americans. So Biden committed to not raising taxes on uh, people who made less than $400,000 a year. Are you saying that you wouldn't raise taxes on anyone, including those uh, like the billionaire tax, which is extremely popular, and others who make well over $400,000 a year? I'm not saying that I won't shift the tax burden. I'm saying that I'm not going to tax people more who I'm not going to raise taxes on people who make less than $400,000 a year. As I said, I may shift the overall tax burden. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that yet. I need to study that issue and I need to sit down with experts and figure out the best way for achieving, for keeping our economy moving and re actually rebooting our economy. And But also, ultimately, I think what you talked about at the beginning, which was to figure out ways to restore the middle class in this country and reduce these extreme dis disparities between very wealthy, the uh, very wealthy, these huge aggregations of wealth and the widespread poverty that we're seeing below. We need to do that. It's not healthy for our society. It is an unstable configuration that cannot support democracy for any kind of sustained periods. One of the reasons I think you're completely right that critics of extreme wealth think that there are anti-democratic implications are because the very, very wealthy have tried to do things like buy their way into elections the way that uh, Bloomberg did in the last cycle. There's obviously an incredibly corruptive influence from lobbying money and politics, things that you've criticized a great deal in the context of the CDC and the pharmaceutical industry. And so I'm curious how you plan to run your own campaign. Do you have any plans to take a no, co no corporate money pledge the way that but, uh, Bernie Sanders did in 2020 and still managed to out fundraise the rest of the field? And if not, how do you plan to manage some of the conflicts of interest that emerge when people, let's say some of the Silicon Valley billionaires who have shown interest in your campaign, start to make demands potentially uh, that are out of step with what the American public would like? Uh, I am going to, I mean, our, you know, there's there, there are limits on what I can accept. You know, the the campaign can only accept contributions of three thousand three hundred dollars per per person. That's the maximum campaign contribution. 
Uh, most of our contributions so far have been much smaller than that. Uh, and, you know, and, I, and we are not legally allowed to accept campaign contributions that are larger than that. Of course, there are these other ways that people contribute, right? They host fundraisers for folks. They're independent expenditures. They're not supposed to be directed by campaigns. But campaigns have found ways of getting around that. I'm not saying you specifically, obviously, but there are ways that campaigns signal how they would like money to be spent. And with Citizens United, there's almost an unlimited ability for corporations to spend uh, to support their own political causes. Is that a concern for you? Do you have any plans to address Citizens United? Do you have any plans to do campaign finance reform? I don't think there's anything that's probably more important for our democracy than figuring out a way to reverse Citizens United from a pragmatic standpoint, because the Supreme Court has upheld that and has, I think, very, very wrongly equated campaign contributions with free speech and essentially given them First Amendment protections. I think that was a very bad decision. I think it's been a catastrophe for our country. Uh, I am open to suggestions about how to reverse Citizens United. It's, it's something that I've been thinking about since 2000, I think 2008, when it was, uh, when that decision came down. You know, we almost lost democracy. We did lose democracy in the, this country and during the Gilded Age in the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, where you had our, our country senators at that point were not directly elected. They were chosen by the legislatures. The big trust, the steel trust, the oil trust, the railroad trust, the sugar trust owned those legislatures. It was literally, literally said of the Pennsylvania state legislature that nobody was for sale because John D. Rockefeller already owned them all and he would not part with them. And that was the way it was for legislatures all over the country. And so those wealthy individuals were choosing the United States senators. They controlled the political parties. They chose the, the president. And um, we were able to rescue democracy. And in 1908, we passed a law. One of the things we did, we passed antitrust law laws, we passed child labor laws. We gave women the vote, uh, but the, probably the most important law that we passed to restore democracy was a law that we passed in 2008 that made it illegal, or 1908, that made it illegal for large corporations to contribute to federal political campaigns. And that law stayed in place for 100 years and protected American democracy. The United States Supreme Court threw out that law in 2008 and unleashed the tsunami of corporate money. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not allowed to coordinate with our super PACs, um, but uh, it's, I think, you know, and Bernie was able to do, as you said, to raise a lot of money. And I think Obama was raised a lot of money. And that's what I'm going to focus on from small donors. Uh, but, you know, if you're a super PAC, I, you know, it, it, the law is just wrong in our country, but it's hard to, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we, you, at, at some point you have to say, OK, I'm going to play by the rules as they are given to us. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to bring a knife to a gunfight. Mm. And um, and uh, so I don't know what they're going to do, but I can see the logic of, of, uh, of taking money from larger donors if you're, you know, if you're supporting somebody that's going to try to reform the system.